one, two. Yeah, it works. Okay, perfect. I feel very strange with this thing on my head, almost like abducted by aliens or something. Uh, so I have this questionable honor to be the last uh, obstacle between you and your lunch. So, uh, and probably everybody is very hungry. And uh, I myself usually get uh, mighty hungry if I see native code. And, uh, uh, but when you are talk about V8, you kind of uh, have to talk about native code. Uh, so I had this problem. I did not want people to get hungry more than they already are. So I decided to invert this and uh, talk about native code in terms of JavaScript. Uh, that might uh, feel like a weird idea because uh, JavaScript is a very high level language, but it's uh, kind of uh, my dream uh, to uh, at some someday develop the JavaScript VM in JavaScript. So it's not entirely strange, it's possible to do that. Uh, so I decided to replace all the native code examples uh, that I usually would do during my talk with uh, JavaScript code. And uh, I'm not actually going to talk about anything new. I decided to revisit fundamentals because I, after my talk at JSConf uh, US, I understood that people don't actually know fundamentals of the JavaScript VMs uh, that they should know if they want to write a high performance JavaScript code. And uh, so I'm going to return to the basics. And this is the basics of JavaScript, the property load from some object. And if you decide to uh, write a VM, you would uh, probably compile it to something like this. I mean, call of some method that loads uh, a property called foo from the object. And then you start reading the specification and then you discover that you have to write at least the code like this to do this load. But this is not actually everything. And then you go deeper and deeper. And then eventually you hit the hash table lookup. What's wrong with that? It's not very performant. I mean, you have to go this path every time you do a load. So you decide to make a first step, which V8 made when it was released, uh, to speed up JavaScript. It's a very simple step. How fast can we become if we speed up each individual load and store or each individual addition, multiplication, each individual operation that has a dynamic behavior because every operation in JavaScript, it has some dynamic lookup built in. Uh, so we want to speed up operations in separation. And as soon as you start doing that, you realize that some operations, they are nice in their behavior and some are naughty. And of course, you don't want to uh, waste your time speeding up those that behave bad. You want to concentrate on the nice ones and make them go as fast as possible. And in the dynamic world, the truth is very simple. The nicest dynamic operation is the one that behaves statically. Because if it behaves statically, you can kind of predict or observe its behavior and reuse your observations during the whole run of your program. And so we have a master plan. The master plan is very simple. You do look up, so we, we discuss lookups of properties. You do look up of the property, and then you cache the fast part of this lookup. Where did you find the property? Was it at the object itself? At which offset? Or was it on the prototype at which offset? Was it a getter or setter? Uh, was it something else? Was it like a lookup on the array of a property called 42? So you cache this information in some condensed way. And next time when you hit the same, the very same lookup in the code, you look at the, what you cached. And then if it's still applicable to this lookup, then you will just use this cached fast path and you will get the speed up. And if it's not applicable, you understand that this operation has been naughty and should be punished with a slowdown. So 
how does it work if we try to express it in so okay this is this is old school technique called inline caching actually yeah it's it was developed for like self and small talk initially long ago and uh, how would it look like if we apply it to this float well first of all we have to distinguish all uh, loads from each other so we give each load an id so in, in native code it happens slightly differently but i'm using the javascript so i have to first of all i have to have the point which i can specialize in this case i have a special global with load number 42 and also i pass the id 42 to make the runtime system aware which uh, load it should uh, adapt to the to the structure of an object if it has the if it has realized that it can be adapted and uh, the code behind this will look like something like this uh, so initially you don't have any information i hope you can read it i think you can read it if you can't the slides will be somewhere sometime uh, so initially there is no information so you have to do a lookup just like you did it before and then you compute this path so lookup now doesn't re return a value actually it returns the path to the property and then uh, you compile some kind of function and hook it into the this uh, load number 42 or load number something and that's essentially what what you have to do and uh, you can experiment with this in javascript you can write some very small program that does this it doesn't have to emulate the whole uh, semantics of javascript you can try just with uh, hash tables as properties no prototype lookups and you will see that it's a huge speed up if in, in, even in pure javascript and in native code it's even more impressive so uh, now the question is uh, how do we make a fast pass out of the path uh, how do we uh, compile this function that does a fast lookup we need two things to do that and first we need uh, to quickly check if the path is still applicable and we need to do a quick load somehow and we really don't want to you to objects to be a hash tables really don't want to so we really want them to be something like a c or java object which are linear sequence of fields at a fixed offsets and you know the type of each object so you know which fields are there and uh, you really want the fast uh, function to look like something like this so even in java you can ask the class of an object so you want each javascript object to have a class you want just to check it for equality and uh, if the check succeeds you want to load a property from a text index and uh, if it doesn't succeed you go to a generic routine which can handle everything and which will later patch the same ic again and stuff like that so and here hidden classes come into play so hidden class for javascript object would be something that's not really accessible from the javascript the normal one but it fully describes the layout of an object and it's uh, like internal semantics uh, for the vm and if two objects uh, have the same hidden class they would have the same layout it's guaranteed that they have the same properties and the same offsets so and uh, this is essentially how you uh, would compile the specialized version of the load for the given class and an index so uh, if you have a pass that says oh this property was found immediately on an object at this offset and the object had this class you would do this thing to compile a specialized version uh, so this class and index they embed it into this uh, fast uh, load ic stuff uh, and this of course works for the prototype as well if you have like objects on the prototype then many people expect that there will be a huge hit for the properties that are on the prototype but this is not actually true because if you look at the structure of this code it can be easily extended to handle the prototypes as well i mean it's just another equality check for the 
hidden class of the prototype to figure out whether it has the property at the same offset. And if you go two layers up, then there will be two checks. So it's a very fundamental approach, as you can see. And uh, yeah, so uh, in the presentation, I actually have some native code, but I really want to skip it because you can look at it later. Or maybe you can return to it. So, uh, so how do these hidden classes actually work? How do you get hidden classes uh, from nothing? And uh, the idea here is also very simple. Uh, you don't want to do any static analysis. You really want an object to build the hidden classes for themselves as they change. Uh, so you remember that uh, I showed you how do you load property. So the definition of the property would look something like that. Actually, there's tons of code. If you look at the standard, there are tons of things you do when you define a property. So I removed all unimportant stuff, but it all boils down to if you set down a simple data property on an object, you eventually will put some descriptor of the property into some hash table. And we want just to hook at this particular place and let it build the hidden class. And what V8 does is very simple. When you define a property, we get the hidden class of an object. And then we define the property on the hidden class. We ask it, give us a class which is almost like you, but with one small change. It has one more property. And uh, this is very, very simple. And then we just uh, hook this new hidden class to the object. So the object gets the new hidden class and we set the property. Uh, so. Of course, if the object already had a property, then it will not change the hidden class unless there are some conditions met. Uh, so, and the thing here, which is uh, important, is that classes are connected to each other. So if you have a hidden class with a property A and you add a property B to it, then the, you get another hidden class with A and B, but it's connected to the previous one. So next time when we want to add a property, we'll get the same hidden class with A and B, not the new one, because we need to compare them for equality. And, uh, and the properties we can store in the linear fashion inside the object. So that's the best illustrated with some example. I like points. Everybody who does EM like points. Uh, they always pop up in the presentations about VMs. Uh, so how does a hidden class structure work in this case? So went to the constructor for the first time, and then we get an object and the hidden class attached to it. It's an empty hidden class. So each constructor has a, its own uh, like initial hidden class that you get when you enter it. And then when you assign the property x, you get a new hidden class which has a property x at site at offset one. And the empty hidden class is connected to it. It says, if you add x to me, you get this one guy. And the same with y. If we enter the second time, we already have this hidden class transition tree in place. So we start from the root and we go down and down. And the objects will get the same hidden class if they are constructed in the same way. So the same properties were assigned in the same order. So, yeah, so you were afraid to ask, but I still put this slide uh, about things about uh, hidden classes. Uh, so, yes, so you understanding how V8 does that, uh, you can also understand what you should avoid. You should avoid adding properties uh, or conditionally adding properties or adding properties in a different order because the objects will get different classes. Uh, and obviously the lookups on such objects, they will be naughty for V8. They would not be nice. The nicest lookup is the one that always sees the same hidden class. Uh, if you add too much properties for some definition of too much, uh, then you will get a slow hash table like object because V8 says nobody would ever want to have a hidden class with like 25, I don't know, 27 properties, something. Uh, 
And uh, if you add something non-trivial, uh, like non-writable property, or you use like object freeze, object seal, getters and setters, we're fixing that with getters and setters, not with object freeze and seal. Uh, then you again get a hash table object. Uh, if you delete a property, it will also be a hash table. So you should be very careful. If you want an object like point, which is uh, constantly accessed in some heavy way, like you use it in your 3D modeling system, you really want it to be fast, C-like. Uh, and you don't, add, you don't do these strange things to it. So, and actually, if you think about it and you understand that hidden classes can capture many things beyond the properties. They, in V8, capture at least these things that I mentioned on the slides. They uh, also look at how, for example, the storage for the index properties looks like. Like, is it an array which is C-like array, continuous and fast to access? Or is it like a dictionary because it's very sparse? Uh, or maybe it contains only doubles, and then I can unbox it and represent as uh, unbox double array. Or maybe it's the array that was produced with a, a WebGL constructor like float32 array, then it has a special backend storage. And uh, does it have holes inside? Because even the C-like arrays, they can still have some small number of holes inside. Uh, and all this information is encoded in the hidden class. And we even try to understand when you attach methods. Like if you have the prototype, then you usually do like foo.prototype.method1 equals some function, and then method2 equals some function. And we really don't want it to be a normal property because normal property you have to test, like you have to get it, and then is it the same function still? We want it to be like a method on a C++ class, which cannot change, well, unless it's virtual, but so. Uh, so we try to capture this also inside the hidden class, and we have this constant function things that basically just by checking the hidden class, you can say you can see what methods are attached to it in one check, many methods. So and we also have some strange stuff to support the to make the object dot create faster, uh, because object dot create essentially creates objects with a new prototypes, and if you you want to have the objects with the same uh, with the same prototype to share the hidden class initially uh, returned by object that create uh, yes so the tr so the, the the ultimate truth is that ICs plus hidden classes they improve local performance and they also improve memory usage because each structure instead of hash table it becomes a packed C like object so uh, now let's look at this code, like it's the um, dot product of uh, two vectors or two points. Uh, and if you look at the non-optimized code for this function, then you see that there are seven inline caches for each operation that has a dynamic behavior, it has inline cache, and there are seven operations. So you have seven inline caches. So it's a seven calls to some runtime routines even fast ones, it still costs. And you have boxing, like uh, every time you return doubles or a call boundary, it has to be boxed. And if you assign to fields, it has to be boxed. So you have boxing on at least three of these calls which operate on doubles. Uh, so, and not all of these inline caches, they're actually independent because a dot x and a dot y, they touch the same object. And the same about b dot x and b dot y, and the same for uh, arithmetic operations. They are all in a sense connected to each other. So, so there are redundancy between inline caches. Four does not uh, like you have three redundancy, like three red uh, redundant checks. Uh, it doesn't seem uh, like much, but if you put everything in the loop, then you start filling this cost of redundant checks and calls and boxing. So what can we do about that? And the answer to this is you, so you want to reduce redundancy between ICs and improve performance inside the function. So you want to go one level up. So previously you concentrated only on 
single operations inside the function. Now you want to view the function as whole and reduce redundancy inside it. Uh, and the answer to this is something that was released two years ago, maybe one year, no, two years. Uh, no, yes. Uh, so it's called crankshaft. It's uh, our uh, adaptive optimizing compiler pipeline for V8. So essentially what it does is that it lets the code run for some time. And then at some point it sees all this function is becoming hot. So I can ask ICs what they saw because each IC it remembers what it saw. It's the point of IC to be specialized for objects that it saw. And I can ask them and they will tell me the truth of, about this function. And I can base my assumptions on this information and optimize the function locally, uh, well, the function as whole. Uh, and uh, let's look at the example. So this is how the non-optimized code will look like if you write it in JavaScript. So you have seven inline caches uh, which do loads and you have inline caches for binary operations as well. So you let this run and then you ask to generate an optimized version. An optimized uh, version will look like something like this. So first of all, there are checks which are now moved to top level from the inline caches that checks the class, the hidden class of A and B. And instead of handling the miss directly in this non optimized or directly in this optimized code, we'll do something called the optimization. It's pretty hard to express actually in JavaScript. That's one of the things that I, I don't know how to correctly express in JavaScript. Uh, the closest uh, uh, analog in JavaScript would be uh, probably the exceptions throw in, but instead of uh, jumping to somewhere up, you basically replace the code you run in place. You switch from the optimized. So if, if this assumption fails, uh, you just go back to non-optimized version and start executing it at the precise point which matches the point of the check in the optimized code. So here you check in the beginning, so you will go to the beginning of the non-optimized code. It can go to the middle of non-optimized code as well if these checks were in the middle. So it knows where to go not to redo any side effects that could be observed outside. So, and uh, so yes, so this is one of the crucial things. You can, instead of handling all the cases in the optimized code, you specialize the optimized code for the common cases and uh, jump back to the non-optimized code in case if assumptions are not holding. Uh, for example, the conversion to double also does this check and also goes to runtime uh, to the non-optimized code if it can't convert. So if you put the string into a property, it will try to convert it to a double. No, it's not a number. Jump back to the non-optimized code that can handle it because non-optimized code can handle everything. That's why it's slow uh, to some definition of slow. Uh, and another thing that it can do is that it can use native types for the VM. It doesn't have to do boxing because it, it knows this is double, this is double, this is double. I can put them in the registers and I can use the native arithmetic instead of boxing. I only have to box when I return uh, from the function. So, and there is another piece of native code. And the, you can actually look at the code yourself. So, uh, you just need to compile V8 with special options and you can ask it to print the code. And the reason why you have to look at the code yourself, I can't show it to you, is because it's tremendously huge uh, for this uh, function. So if I put it on the slides, it will look like something like this and this and this. And uh, there are like three slides with a font of size six and you cannot read it. And uh, this is mostly because double tagging and untagging is uh, long, but the actual like, so load of the field is one instruction. You cannot see it, but there is like only one move from an object to a register, an object field to a register. 
and uh, but the double tagging and tagging it still has to handle some corner cases uh, with tagging and uh, in a different ways like we tag the small integers one way and we put the big doubles into the boxes and then you have to do a lot of stuff to untag them but uh, like once it's done then the multiplication and the addition it's one instruction on the xmm register so yeah so essentially what crankshaft is is the is a thing that can eliminate redundancy in the locally inside the function when they say locally it means now the function scope as whole uh, it doesn't do it globally in a sense uh, that it does it over all program uh, only inside the function uh, it can deal with loops so if you have a loop which has some invariant checks or invariant operations inside that always hold it will move it out of the loop so because you still want to see somehow through the instruction boundaries uh, you want to inline functions because once you inline the function its body becomes accessible for you to analyze uh, so crankshaft can do that as well it helps greatly because it allows to avoid like boxing unboxing on the function call boundaries and also allows to hoist stuff that becomes invariant when you inline it can understand what uh, it's not intensify it's intensify i don't know what i was thinking i made it during the night uh, so it can intensify some built-ins in javascript like all mass functions uh, will be converted to efficient uh, assembly codes and uh, it understands the semantics of some uh, pretty heavy operations like foo.apply so if it knows that the foo is a function then it can just make the call direct or even inline it and completely eliminate the application and of course it can figure where to use like native doubles and where these doubles contain only in city tools so it can use the in city tools uh, efficiently so and where we go from here is not clear yet because there are a lot of things that still not done in crankshaft there are not operations even of javascript supported like if you use with it will just say no i don't like with i will not optimize this function i will just let it run in the non-optimized code so there are a lot of things to do in the crankshaft itself before starting thinking about the next big step like maybe to global analysis or something like that so i still have time and i have the end of slides so i will just return back to the native code i did not show you before okay so how will the inline cache look in the native code to embrace yourself so it will look like something like that so you load an object into register ex uh, and then you load the property name into register e6 and then you jump somewhere to the generic routine which is called load i see means because initially you don't know anything no information then what it does is that it compiles the small piece of code that is specialized to the load so here i assume that it knows the hidden class of the object and that everything is cacheable and the property was found on the object itself so it's basically these four instructions you compare the hidden class which is in the, the first field in the header and then if it doesn't match you go again to the miss and if it matches you just load the property one instruction and you return so yeah so this 0x50 la 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 it's the address of the hidden class which is an object uh, which describes layout and the strange minus one is because the pointers in the systems are all tagged with ones. Uh, you can see that every pointer to an object, a pointer to a string adds at one, and the pointer to a hidden class adds at one. And everything that does not add at one is a number, actually, like the small integer shifted by one to the to the right, to the left, to the right here. Uh, is it left? right yeah so uh so multiplied by two i will say better than figuring out which direction is shifted so uh this direction uh so mm -hmm. yeah so and you can see that the objects they live directly in uh, the properties they live dire directly in the objects so in fact the property storage in v8 is very complicated how it's done 
but there are some properties that live directly in the objects and if this overflows then we start storing them in a small attached array and then if that overflows then you can grow this array and if that still overflows then at some point you will switch to hash table yeah so and once this compiled back to the thingy then it would go up the stack and see the because on the stack you have the return address to this call which called the load miss we still call the load miss uh, we'll find this call instruction in the instruction stream directly like the, in, the encoded native code call something call address related one and then it will ba -bam, patch it uh, directly in the native code and we'll point it to this compiled small stuff and the stuff itself is actually an object in the code space in unit heap so it's fully like garbage collected thingy uh, yeah and i see now is a new state it now points to the specialized stuff and uh, if crankshaft comes it will ask it what did you see yeah so that was it that was all that i wanted to say i told it very fast despite having many slides thank you for your attention and i'm ready for your questions yeah there are questions let's start here it's close now so you mentioned quickly that uh you don't uh 